The amygdala is a very important brain region. In fact, the amygdala's job is to alert the rest of the brain to when something important is in the immediate environment. This video will serve as an introduction to the amygdala with a focus on how stress affects its function. Throughout, I'll be relying on peer-reviewed articles, especially chapter 11 of the Handbook of Amygdala Structure and Function by Nicole Ferrara and colleagues published in 2020. Neuroscientists once hypothesized that the amygdala was the brain's fear center. Since it's strongly activated in response to scary and threatening stimuli, and because damage to this region can result in deficits in a person's ability to experience fear. However, researchers now believe that the amygdala activates in response not specifically to scary stuff, but more generally to so-called biologically relevant stuff. A biologically relevant stimulus is anything that can influence survival or reproduction directly or indirectly. Therefore, food, pain, social threats, and social rewards all increase amygdala activity. This wide range of functions raises an interesting point about the amygdala. It is not really just one brain region. To understand this, let's briefly look at the amygdala's anatomy. Anatomy of the amygdala. The amygdala gets its name from the Greek term amygdala for almond, because it looks, well, kind of like an almond. It's part of the brain's limbic system, which is involved in emotion, memory, and behavior, and it sits just in front of the hippocampus. The amygdala connects to many brain regions, including the prefrontal and temporal cortices, the hippocampus, basal ganglia, hypothalamus, and thalamus. Also called the amygdaloid complex, the amygdala is composed of 13 anatomically distinct nuclei. A nucleus is a cluster of neurons which connect with other brain regions. So according to Ferreira et al., these many nuclei sort into just a few functionally distinct clusters. The basolateral complex, or BLA, the central amygdala, or CEA, and the medial amygdala. But some researchers would categorize them a little differently. Okay, so to understand how the amygdala works, let's examine how neural signals flow through this complex of nuclei. By the way, I'm Andrew and this is Sense of Mind. If you wanna learn more about your brain through explainer videos like this one, as well as in-depth interviews with neuroscientists and psychologists, make sure to like and subscribe. All right, back to information flow through the amygdala. For our purposes, just remember the following simplification. The basolateral amygdala receives input from sensory and association cortices and the thalamus about what is going on in the immediate environment. The BLA then processes and sends that information to the central amygdala, the CEA, which further processes the information and finally sends signals to various regions involved in behavioral, emotional, and or physiological responses to whatever's going on. Now, three other details are important. First, the amygdala's connections are often two-way, meaning that, for example, the BLA also sends signals to the association and sensory cortices and may influence their function. Second, the central amygdala also receives some input from the cortex and other regions, not just from the basolateral amygdala. And finally, the amygdala is usually under inhibitory control by the prefrontal cortex, meaning that the PFC is effectively filtering the responses that the amygdala is suggesting. As Robert Sapolsky puts it in his 2017 book, Behave, quote, when the amygdala wants to mobilize a behavior, say fleeing, it talks to the frontal cortex, seeking its executive approval, end quote. But Sapolsky notes that when under stress, the amygdala may bypass this approval process and directly activate a response. This brings us to a broader question. How does stress affect the flow of information through the amygdala? And what does that do to our emotions and behaviors? Fight or flight, stress and the amygdala. The fight or flight response is a physiological reaction to stress which includes increased heart rate, blood pressure, and mobilization of energy into the bloodstream, all of which are helpful in either fighting off or fleeing from a threat, like a mugger in the street, for example. Importantly, however, the fight or flight response activates not only as a reaction to immediate physical danger, but also to more abstract social threats. For example, you may experience it upon learning that your retirement fund was just destroyed by a market crash or that a war just broke out overseas. The amygdala triggers the fight or flight response, causing the release of stress hormones and neurotransmitters throughout the body and brain, as well as increased activity in the sympathetic nervous system, or SNS. 
The SNS is the branch of the autonomic nervous system that promotes immediate action right now, as opposed to the parasympathetic nervous system, which promotes relaxation and related processes like digestion and sleep. Thus, this system is adaptive when you face acute stressors, like when you need to run away from that mugger. But for chronic psychological stress, for example, living in a neighborhood where mugging is commonplace or having a particularly mean and micromanaging boss, that can contribute to health problems with digestive issues being particularly common. Now, earlier we noted that the PFC's ability to inhibit the amygdala can be diminished during acute stress. More generally, acute stress seems to amplify the amygdala's ability to influence our behavior by facilitating the flow of information from the basolateral amygdala to the central amygdala. It also seems to make the amygdala more reactive in the first hour after the stressor. When this occurs, the response triggered by the amygdala is faster, but it's also likely to be inappropriate for the situation. In Behave, Robert Sapolsky suggests that this could lead someone, say a police officer, to mistake a cell phone for a gun, leading the cop to shoot first for fear of himself or maybe an innocent bystander being shot first. Likewise, chronic stress enhances amygdala activity. And with chronic stress or severe childhood stress, the amygdala reacts to a greater range of stimuli. As Ferrara et al. explain, quote, this non-filtering of unimportant stimuli may lead the amygdala to treating all stimuli as important and worthy of a response, end quote. The symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD, result partly from traumatic experiences that teach the amygdala to be hyperreactive. Okay, let's take a step back and talk about how the stress-induced hyperreactive amygdala may have affected your life through what is sometimes called amygdala hijack. Have you ever exploded with anger in response to something relatively minor, like experiencing road rage when you run into unexpected traffic on your commute to work, breaking something in a fit of extreme anger, or saying something nasty to someone who didn't deserve it? I know I have, though I'm not proud to admit that. To describe such aberrant emotional behavior, in the 1990s, the psychologist Daniel Goleman coined the term amygdala hijack. To be clear, this idea is, as Goleman himself has said, a very simplistic model of how the brain works, and it should not be taken as perfectly accurate nor comprehensive. It is, however, a useful heuristic for thinking about those moments when we almost seem to turn into different people and do things that we later regret. Now, the idea is simple. There are times when the amygdala initiates the fight or flight response and it's very difficult for the frontal cortex and the rest of the brain to rein in the often destructive behavior that ensues. One way of thinking about the function of anger as an emotion is that it's all about overcoming something that's keeping you from achieving your goal, or maybe destroying something that is threatening your well being. You might speed recklessly through traffic when you experience road rage, or throw your phone into a wall after having a very frustrating discussion with someone or insult somebody simply because you know it will hurt them. None of those responses are particularly rational and you will undoubtedly regret them later. But in the moment, they may feel like they were the right thing to do. That is the amygdala hijack in action. It's the amygdala bypassing the prefrontal cortex and persuading the rest of the brain to attack, destroy, escape, or otherwise overcome the immediate source of stress. Okay, up to this point, we have only discussed the amygdala in the context of danger and stress. But as I mentioned at the beginning, the amygdala's job may be to signal the presence and help select a response to any biologically relevant information, not just the kind that produces fight or flight responses. For example, in monkeys, the amygdala activates in response to socially relevant information, such as faces and especially to emotional facial expressions. It also seems to fire more in response to faces of familiar monkeys. And in experiments with humans, it's been shown that the faces that are most relevant, so in the context of an experiment, that would probably be an experimenter, the person telling you what to do and helping you through the task, pictures of those faces tend to activate the amygdala more than even familiar faces to the person, so people that they know from their family, and definitely more than unfamiliar faces. So it seems that the amygdala is activating in response to what is the most relevant social information for the moment. Yet the amygdala's function may be even more general than that. Let's see why. The amygdala and biological relevance prediction error signals. 
In some ways, the amygdala appears to be a prediction error detector in the brain. Specifically, it may signal to the rest of the brain when something is unexpected and relevant to the animal's survival or reproduction. Now, the brain is constantly predicting what kinds of things the organism is likely to encounter. But these predictions need to be tested by comparing them to data coming in from the senses. Now, that difference between what the brain expects and what is really out there is called a prediction error. I've talked before about how the dopamine system is involved in a specific kind of prediction error called reward prediction error. So check out those videos if you're interested. In this case though, the amygdala may be more involved in detecting prediction errors as they relate to biologically relevant information in general and possibly to aversive stimuli in particular. Let's examine these possibilities in turn. The more general case is that in primates, the amygdala or parts of the amygdala fire in response to novel stimuli of any kind. For example, if you listen to a series of simple tones that are all identical, except for a few randomly inserted novel tones, your amygdala will activate more strongly in response to the novel tones. Similarly, if instead there was a silence where there was supposed to be a tone, it will also activate. Crucially, it appears to be the unexpected nature of these stimuli combined with the fact that they are important for the task at hand, which activates the amygdala, as it activates most strongly when the subject is supposed to listen for unexpected sounds, rather than if he is just passively listening without any specific goal. Now, when it comes to the more specific idea that the amygdala is involved in aversive prediction error, one of the most well-known facts about the amygdala is that it is necessary for fear conditioning. Fear conditioning is an experimental paradigm where a rodent is taught to associate a stimulus that is naturally aversive, like a mild electric shock, with a neutral stimulus, like a brief auditory tone, such that when they merely hear that tone, it causes them to freeze in place, indicating a fear or aversion response. It can take a few trials for this learning to occur, and the uncertainty, or prediction error, is greatest at the beginning of the experiment and lowest at the end. And as a 2021 review by Mihala Iordanava and colleagues states, quote, this pattern of decline across fear learning is also observed in outcome evoked BLA activity as measured by various neural recording methods. In other words, the basolateral amygdala is most active early on when uncertainty is high and less active later when the electric shock is easily predicted by the sound. Crucially, these authors note that if the mouse is suddenly shocked without first playing the sound, the BLA activity goes way up again, indicating that it is the predictability that makes the amygdala activity go quiet rather than the mouse simply getting used to the shocks. So if the amygdala is indeed a prediction error detector, whether specifically for aversive stimuli or more generally for any biologically relevant stimuli, then how does stress affect it? Well, the effect is straightforward. Stress makes the amygdala more sensitive to prediction errors, to the point that it detects errors where there are none, or at least that's the idea. In other words, stress, especially chronic stress, would make the amygdala rather like the boy who cried wolf, screaming wolf at the top of its lungs, not only when there is real danger or other important information, but also when there is little sign of it. But unlike the townspeople in that story who, after only a couple false alarms, decided not to listen to the boy anymore, which left him helpless and caused his sheep to be eaten when the real wolf came, the chronically stressed out brain has little choice but to listen to the wolf crying amygdala and respond as if it's telling the truth. This process may be at work in PTSD and other anxiety disorders, as that's just kind of another way of saying that the amygdala is hyperreactive. But through therapy, mindfulness, and other techniques, it's often possible to recalibrate the amygdala to activate only in response to really biologically relevant prediction errors, and thereby allow us to live happier, healthier lives, even when stressors inevitably arise. How to calm your amygdala. Now, one of the most effective strategies that I've found for regulating and ultimately diminishing your anger or otherwise explosive amygdaloid responses over time is a combination of mindfulness meditation but also paying attention to your triggers. What makes you go into that kind of amygdala hijack state? Recording and journaling about those kinds of experiences and really paying attention to the thoughts and feelings that 
come up before and during that episode can really help you take control of your behavior and your feelings and thoughts in that moment and allow you to override them to realize that this response is not going to get you where you want to go. And ultimately that is the prefrontal cortex, the, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex regulating the amygdala. So I really recommend the book Rage by Ronald Potter Efron. Um, and I will link that below as well as a book called Designing the Mind, The Principles of Psychotexture by Ryan Bush. So I'll list both of those below. And ultimately, these are just really useful tools for becoming happier, less stressed, and less reactive. So I hope that helps. All right, that is it. Thank you so much for listening uh, or watching this video. This episode of Sense of Mind is brought to you by the Diamond Mind Foundation. It was written and produced by me, Andrew Cooper Sansone. Thank you so much for watching. I'll catch you next time.